Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we are discussing the absurdity of existentialism. Oh, that was good. That but was good. Before we get started. What are we drinking, guys? I don't know. It's more absurd. Live for that intro. Uh, uh, we are drinking Mr. Wiggles Double Dank IPA. From the Raw and Sons Brewing Company in Fort Worth, Texas. <clears throat> Sounds like I'm gargling it over here. i got a <laughs> terrible voice today. Uh, this is a cool can. If you're not watching on our YouTube channel, then you missed the moment of realization halfway through our <laughs> intro song that I didn't actually have an intro written for didn't this have an show. open. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I didn't ask this time like I usually do. Yeah. Um, I thought you had my back, Mike. Well, this I, is your fault. I've been asking <laughs> every time. And you kept giving me these, of course I do answer. So I figured, well, of course she does. Of course she does. Of course, course she, she does. does. Of course. So, and I did, didn't I? Yes, you did. Every time. So exactly what in the hell are we doing? We're talking about absurdism, uh, which is a philosophy that is, is kind of a branch off of existentialism. It's, um, yeah, kind of a, a, a and a response to nihilism to an extent. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and and you know, as I've been going through this, uh, I, I've kind of reoriented my views on on existentialism, nihilism, and, and now absurdism. Uh, I always looked at existentialism and nihilism as in competition with each other, uh, but I'm more and more starting to see existentialism as a critique on nihilism and this as a further critique a further development i'll say of of the ideas i guess i've always kind of seen them as as uh different levels of the same kind of basic mm -hmm. philosophy uh so so uh i i guess i'm going to learn something today then mm -hmm. but before we get too much into absurdism i i don't think that a proper discussion on absurdism can be had without Talking about the father of, of absurdism, uh, Albert Camus. Albert Camus, yeah. Uh, or if you're from America, Albert Camus. Uh, Camus. Yeah. Camus. Yeah. Albert, Albert Camus. Camus. Albert, Albert yeah. Camus. Uh, a, a French philosopher from uh, the French colony of Algeria, actually. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, lived in the early 20th century. Do you have the, the dates on that? Yeah, he was born in 1913, and he dies uh, in 1960. He's only 46 years old when he dies. Wow. Which is it's pretty impressive. Uh, uh, when you realize everything that he accomplished at this time period. He lived a full-ass oh, life, yeah. though. The guy won the Nobel Prize for Literature at the age of 44, I think. Yeah. Or, you know, I, I'm, I, I mentioned before the show that this is one of those people that just makes me feel incompetent. Right? Yeah, well, yeah. And, 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 and in addition to all these prestigious awards he won, and we'll, this will make a little more sense once we get into the philosophy, he was also known as a playboy. He uh, uh, quite often would go on escapades with, with ladies plural yeah, yeah um was was quick to to have a drink and a laugh partied all the time he he had fun in those years the partying well, partying probably cost him his life there with that with yeah. that you know he dies in a car accident mm -hmm. uh that that you know it's suspected that he had a little bit what imagine that yeah. yeah and and funnily enough uh he had a train ticket in his pocket and made a last minute decision to take uh, a car now i can i don't know his reasoning but i can say in my own experience when i've been drinking uh and and there was a decision to change modes of transportation from some scheduled it was usually because i decided no i don't want to leave for the train yet i'm gonna keep yeah. drinking <laughs> yeah. now usually to be not fair, a good plan no yeah. it is not it is a yeah. terrible plan not to say that he was the most responsible of people but he also was not the driver of the vehicle no he, he wasn't he died wasn't. his uh his, his, his uh manager wasn't it yeah, yeah, his publicist, publicist manager, manager, something like that. I don't that, remember yeah. who, what exactly yeah. the guy's title was. Well, let's just blame the tree. How does that sound? <laughs> Whatever. I'm sure the tree was drinking. Yes. Who the, who the hell put that tree there, right? Exactly. exactly. All right. So, uh, so anyway, uh, Albert Camus um, comes up in, as you said, uh, what was the town? Um, He's in French Algeria. French Algeria, um, and he. 
he kind of starts to identify with existentialism, but but he has some critiques on it. And to kind of uh, broadcast out his philosophy, which we'll get into later, he ends up writing three uh, well-known books. I'm going to say the most popular of which is The Stranger, his first book, but uh, he writes two more. Uh, Good, in, weird uh, book. Yeah. The, the Myth of Sisyphus is a pretty popular one as that well. That was yes. the one I couldn't That's remember. That's the one yeah. that I had to read in college. Um, and it's actually... Excuse me. It's actually a novel, but it's yeah. it's it's a novel that that's uh, that's set in this this. Uh, well, to me, it was a nihilistic world, but 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 you know, it's it's a it's it's dealing with the philosophical question at the time. Uh, uh, the myth of Sisyphus is a uh, uh, you know about a man that 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 kills a guy in Algeria just to see what it feels like, and uh, no, that's a stranger. Well, yeah. he, it's, he doesn't. It, it, the, the Sisyphus is the one where, where it's a novel version, though, right? I don't know. Uh, this was about three hours on on audiobook. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe not. Maybe I'm getting the two confused. Yeah. Maybe the stranger's the one that I read, where he kills a man yep. just yeah. to see what it's like, and then shows no no regret for it. Yes. Yeah. Because yes. the myth of Sisyphus is the one um, where he tells the story of Sisyphus, who yeah yeah yeah. Um, I'm getting the books confused. Yeah. Yeah. And he finds happiness in this yeah. mundanity. He he asks the reader to imagine Sisyphus. Uh, Eternally pushing this rock of a hill. If you're yeah, not yeah, yeah. familiar with with the the, the myth of Sisyphus, uh, uh, go go. Not necessarily the book, although it's a, a it's it's good. But go, you know, look at what it is. Yeah. He uh, imprisoned death so that humans would not. That's right. That's right. Suffer I, death I got anymore. the books turned yeah. around. Yeah. He also wrote the Rebel and the Plague. The Rebel's yes. also a pretty big one. So. Yeah. But he he asks that the um, the reader uh, imagine Sisyphus to be this. Um, uh, uh, happy guy uh, that that he is eternally pushing this rock but that that while he's doing this he he finds kind of uh, a joy in his labor he he yeah. he is happy with his life yeah a task that should be maddening he actually finds peace and happiness in much as people do in their nine to fives every day you know yeah. people find happiness in their nine to five i think generally they do i think some do i think some do yeah I, I i think i think you know people tend to hit what we call a midlife crisis but uh if they were completely miserable and unhappy in their lives why do they continue to yeah, do it that's a good you know? point that's a good sometimes um, you're stuck yeah uh, um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I kind of reject that idea, but I do understand what you're saying. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I I don't think that he. In, in fact, I think he um, would argue that the contentness that people find in their nine to five is a form of philosophical suicide, which yeah. I'm sure we'll yeah. we'll cover uh, in more detail later. I, I want to talk briefly about the stranger because I think it's going to lead into some of the the arguments of the philosophy. Um, and, and kind of set a scene. So The Stranger is actually a very oddly written book. Um, it goes from scene to scene building a narrative uh, with a bunch of overly simplified characters who weave together into a very complex world. But the whole time the book is going on, it is not focusing on major plot points. It's actually focusing on the very mundane objects and and pauses and oddities and speech that are going on through these plot points as the plot develops as mike said uh, uh later uh the protagonist ends up killing a guy and, and being sentenced to death over it um but i think what's more interesting is the the way that the protagonist kind of takes everything going on in the book through through a marriage a death of his mother the the murder itself um, in a very uh, uh, stoic and um, uh, uh, apathetic apathetic manner, uh, he just kind of goes through life and, and goes along with, with whatever's uh, uh, asked of him. Now, this is not to say that he does not have uh, any moral convictions about what he does, but he, he, he kind of pontificates the morality of it while saying, yeah, why not? Let's, let's give it a shot. Uh, sometimes uh, 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 very good deeds, sometimes very helpful to society, and and sometimes very dark. Uh, uh, one in particular that 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 strikes me is a friend of his um, suspects his his girlfriend of cheating on him under very dubious evidence and beats her. Um, and in fact, it's the, the the guy he kills ends up being the the brother of the woman, um, and, and it, it kind of leads to the conflict. But he asks the protagonist to write him a love letter because he 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 can't really write that well, um, in order to get her back so he can beat her one more time. 
Uh, and the protagonist, in, in, in a very nonchalant manner, says, "Sure, why not? I'll if you want a love letter written, I'll write it." Like because uh, he's bored. Yeah, like I, I have no reason not to write the love letter. Um, and even with the dubiousness of it, of his evidence, says, "Yeah, I mean, I, if you think she cheated on you, you know, sure, uh, we can go with that." Now, I think there is is some framing when you consider the trial later of the time period of the 1940s when it's set, uh, in which the 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 dubiousness of the evidence of the evidence, I'll say, uh, would have been considered much less dubious and much more justifiable um, than it it is and it would modern- be today. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but not completely, you know, black and white for sure. Uh, definitely not in justification. It's not like he walked in on her. Right, right. He 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 he, he sees her f- some financial information that she's bought some stuff that he as the the provider didn't know where she got the money from and so she must be having an affair um so anyway all that just all that leads up and and kind of culminates in a conversation with him on death row between him and a priest in which the priest is uh trying desperately to 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 uh give him a deathbed salvation before he goes on death row and he he kind of has this this really intense argument with him about religion and about how he doesn't he doesn't want to spend the last few moments of his life pondering that uh, he wants to kind of in, enjoy his life this is the end of it uh, and he finds some solace in, in in the fact that that he's about to end his his life is about to be ended and that he has some time um, and that he's he's not going to turn to this thing that he doesn't believe uh, in the very end. Now, the the conversation's interesting, and uh, I, I would say I think that it is definitely slanted by the author, but I don't think that it is completely unfair to both sides, if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, but the reason that I think that that conversation, that, that climax of the book, uh, is significant is uh, Albert Camus um, kind of accepted nihilism and existentialism as a philosophy. For a little while. Yeah, um, uh, a- a- until he critiques it. And he says that once you realize that life is without meaning, that there is no greater meaning to life, that there are three responses that most people have. Uh, the first is suicide. Well, yeah. if, if my life doesn't have meaning, why live it? I should end it. And, and he, he kind of views this, this response as the weakest of the three responses. Okay. Um, he, he, That's he, interesting. He considers it shallow. He says that the second response that people have, and he almost uh, uh, puts these in chronology, like if you, like, the stages of grief, like if you make it past the first one, you'll reach the second one. Yeah. He says the the go ahead. Oh, well, and I was gonna say he he characterizes that stage as um, this is the solution for um, people who are unable to cope with the meaninglessness of existence. I'm I'm interested in that because uh, you know in the myth of Sisyphus, the uh, the very first line of the book is that the only philosophical question is whether to commit suicide. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if, if, if he, if he changes his, his belief as he goes on, because that was a very, you know, almost a pro suicide idea when you see it. It, it sounds like it is when you take just that quote. Um, but when you really start to look at, um, the things that, uh, Camus said and, and his writings more as a whole, um, I don't think he was advocating for suicide so much there as he was saying um, that every philosophical question that we ask, um, he he believed that the whole of philosophy was an attempt to figure out what the purpose of life was, um, why we were here, and what the fuck we should be doing while we're here. Okay. Um, and... And it was his belief that all of that led back to this question of, should we keep living or not? Yeah, and, and not an individualistic question of, should I kill myself or not? Okay. Yeah, and, and I also wonder, not having read the book, uh, if, if his intent was, as I've seen in many other uh, works of literature, to lead the reader through the stages, or was it you know, to, to lead him there and stop? 
You, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. But I don't know. I read it so many years ago, I can't remember anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then the, the, the next response that he brings up is to accept the myth of meaning. And he very strongly frames this around religion, though not exclusively. Yeah. Uh, he says we could accept that that maybe there's a deity that gives us meaning, or or and and he he didn't even necessarily direct it at one religion. He kind of very broadly talks about many religions, and he talks about some of the issues with that. Um, he says uh, 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 one to to just accept it blindly is it's the kind of give up on the the broad the the real world as it is to, to, to kind of give up on on the world as it actually is he also says it also puts you in necessary and direct conflict with conflicting myths of of your your purpose uh you know whether whether you know your christians are being put at, at odds with islam mm-hmm. or buddhists are being put at odds with with islam or or yeah whichever religion it is whichever faith system it is that you choose to believe in you're suddenly at odds with all of the other faith systems yeah yeah. And so he, he says that that conflict uh, necessarily arises out of it. Uh, I also wonder, this is not an argument I read from him, uh, but I, I do wonder after reading some of his other works if he might have um, uh, compared it to uh, uh, many of the myths that, that you know children choose to believe in out of convenience. One that you've brought up many times is uh, I refuse not to believe in Santa Claus Amen. because <laughs> I was told I wouldn't get presents if I don't. You it's know? true. True. Um, so I wonder if he. I don't know. Have you ever tried not believing in Santa and just see what happens? I don't want to risk it. I understand. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, but I do wonder if that comparison would would, would be there. Uh, so that's the second stage. And before we move on to the third stage, Go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. Um, one of the things that I found particularly interesting in um, the stage of philosophical suicide, um, he talks about how your obsess, uh, uh, acceptance of some faith system as a, uh, as a false meaning to your life actually stunts your growth as a human being, uh, not physically, but philosophically and intellectually, um, which I found to be particularly interesting. When I started studying um, absurdism and I was, I was looking at philosophical suicide, um, I, I actually started to liken it to um, the way that a lot of people will, I mean, I mean, you look at the stats on how much television and how many, you know, how many hours we're spending in front of um, screens of any kind, really. And it appeared to me maybe to be what I was thinking would be intellectual suicide. Mm-hmm. Um but very much the same sort of way, but not so much related to religion. Um, as I kind of studied a little bit more, I noticed, as you commented earlier, that he was not um, speaking exclusively about religion with his uh, stage of philosophical suicide, and that um, that kind of contentedness in acts that aren't actually growing you intellectually and philosophically um, would actually fall under that umbrella. So. Hmm. Yeah, and, and no, I, I agree, and, and and I think that is is a very important point to to make sure that 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 is clear because I think a lot of people when they hear that think of it as solely an attack on religion. Yeah. And while there is no question that that he was he was making a, a critique and rejection of religion, I'll even say, uh, I don't think it was solely directed at religion. He but well, the thing is he. He went out of his way when talking about religion. I found this fascinating of saying that that while he questioned organized religion, he said, I am not an atheist. Right. Mm, yes. He went out of his way to say that that, that, that he couldn't he couldn't <laughs> get to the point where he, he believed there wasn't a first cause. Right. Mm-hmm. And and I found I found that interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Much a, more of a deist. Yeah, well, I think so, but not even I don't my understanding <laughs> is that he didn't even recognize uh, the deity as a as a uh, personality, it was a first cause. It was science, or it was, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I was. It was I, a catalyzing event of some some kind, kind of event. Uh, I saw. I was listening to a to a YouTube uh, explanation of this on the way up here today, and there was a quote in there, and it was somebody trying to explain. It wasn't. It wasn't Camus saying it himself, but he said that uh, that the uh, <clears throat> the atheist is actually a polytheist. 
because while they don't believe in a God, they believe in all of these first causes, which is the same thing as at, at, as, at, as being a yeah. you know, being a being a religion. Mm-hmm. So I think he would have recognized this as a religion, just not as an organized theistic religion. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. And you know, uh, one interesting point that I, that that you kind of jarred my memory on uh, that he was making uh, when he was talking about the second stage is he said if there is a, a, an overarching godlike deity that created everything and and that their mind whatever if you can even have a mind or call it a mind but their mind uh, would be so vastly foreign to us that that it would be absurd to try to like give reason to it using our very basic understanding of yeah. reason that it would be as absurd an act um uh, to try to find purpose in a deity because uh, our ideas of purpose would be so small compared to his as it would be uh, to just accept the the absurdism of not having a purpose, right? Uh, so so he, he kind of makes a critique to say, even if you're right that there's a deity, the fact that you can find meaning in that is itself an absurdity. Yeah. The idea that, um, that we have no purpose is... Um, equal in a lot of ways to the idea that we are not capable of comprehending a purpose if one exists, um, according to an all-powerful, all-knowing deity of some kind. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, all that to say, we can finally get to the, the third stage, which he considered the strongest reaction or, 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 or the best reaction. And that is uh, uh, to embrace... The absurdity of a life without purpose. To embrace the freeing idea that you aren't bound to a specific uh, 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 reason for being, that you can you can enjoy your life without purpose. This is where I need scotch. This is this is this is where I always go off the cliff. Uh, it just seems so hopeless to me. Uh, so, you know, you talk about uh, em- embracing the absurdity of a life without purpose. Um, but he actually took that a step further mm-hmm. and and said that we should embrace the absurdity of the universe mm-hmm. itself. Yeah. Um, you and I were talking about this uh, the other day when I brought up the absurdity that uh, in the anatomy of our bodies, our playground is right next to our dump. Yeah. Um, like that that's fucking yeah. absurd if yeah. we look at it. Um, and, and that's the sort of hilariousness and ridiculousness that I think he would argue illustrates that our world is just a mess. Well, and something I find interesting in the whole thing is many of the conflicts that arise in our um, fairy tales and novels come from the the imprisonment of purpose. Mm-hmm. Whether it's Princess Jasmine not wanting to be a prize for a man, or whether it's Fiddler on the Roof and his daughters not wanting to continue the life of a farmer, or what, whatever that is, it is the idea of being imprisoned by purpose and, and wanting to break free of that, that we find uh, as the main conflict in much of our literature, yet many people, when presented with the idea of this very freedom, will run back to the shackles of purpose mm-hmm. and 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 so it kind of creates this conflict of what do what do we want as, as a species they run the back to philosophical suicide the oh absolutely like i have spent numerous anxiety ridden nights fretting about if about how i don't know what my fuck like if i have a purpose i don't know what the fuck it is and whatever I'm doing to like, I don't know if the steps that I'm taking right <laughs> now are leading to my purpose or if I'm walking away from it. Um, you know, I was like, I was ready to argue with you uh-huh. because to me, the, the, a purpose is liberating in a lot of ways. Uh-huh. But then I got thinking about things I've myself said in the last couple of couple of weeks here. And I can understand the idea of a shackle of purpose where, yeah. where you feel like. You know, this is what I'm supposed to do, and I'm I'm, I'm tied to the. I can I can see that. Yeah, my, my, I, one of my favorite scenes in, in the whole Rick and Morty franchise. Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> here we go. Uh, Rick makes this little robot, and he has these little like knife hands and stuff, and oh, and he he comes to life. So and, painful. And he says, uh, "Who am I? Where am I?" And he says, uh, "Pass me the butter." 
And he says, oh, okay. And he grabs the butter and passes it over and cuts a little butter and gives it to him. He goes, what is my purpose? And he says, you pass the butter. <laughs> and he's, and then he's like, this robot just gets depressed. Oh. Like, that is, that I was created to pass butter. Yeah. That is why I'm here. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> You know? It is. It is awful. I mean, we have we have all this great literature. You know, we have Shakespeare. We have uh, all this great stuff out there. And John goes to Rick and Morty. I just. Uh, but for real, like. But it does seem appropriate. Yeah. If if I were to discover tomorrow that my purpose in life was to uh, make pandas forcibly procreate. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, that's that's where I went for some reason. Um, but if hey, my purpose... We're all into diff- different things. It's okay. If my purpose was to save pandas as a species by making them, by forcing them to procreate, like, I would be fucking devastated. Well, and I think the shackles of purpose come because... If, if you do have an overarching purpose, you don't get to pick your purpose. Of course, the king is going to love his purpose. Usually, he gets to, to rule over the kingdom. But then there's the, the harem, and it's like, well, what's my purpose? You make babies for the king. And that's what you do. Depends yeah. on how good the king is at it. <laughs> I mean, you know, fair enough. And then there's a guy who cleans the king's Whether toilet. Whether or not he beats you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a guy who cleans the king's toilet. Yeah. What is your job? You scrub the shit. Yeah. You know, and you don't, and, and while there are some purposes who are like, great, and, and you get to, you get to, to be a, a, a Nobel Prize winner at the age of, of 40 and, 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 and re, reinvent philosophy, that's great. That is not the majority of purposes. No, you're yeah. right. You're right. Well, yeah. uh, and, and it comes down to whether you believe that, that that's your purpose. Okay, we're getting off topic. Whether you believe your purpose is, is given to you or whether you set your purpose. Yeah. And to yes. me, if you set your purpose, then it's a liberating thing. But if your purpose is something that is preordained, it's, a, it's, it's not. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that's a great point. I think, I think that's probably a, a lot of the point that he was trying to make is we are born and given no purpose. The universe assigns us no purpose, and we very much get to assign our own purpose. I yeah. like that. Yeah. I, can, I can live with that. Yeah. It, and that doesn't make me want to kill myself. Yeah, yeah because if, if my purpose is predestined, then... I am inherently going to feel guilt if I choose not to fulfill my purpose. Welcome to Protestantism. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a lot of what he was trying to combat and, and the existentialists and the nihilists were trying to combat was this idea that we have some preordained purpose yeah. that we are required to fulfill. Um, yeah. But they looked out at the world and said, but why? And... And the answer to this is embrace the absurdity, embrace the lack of purpose, and do something you know, for it, yourself. It, it really bothers me that, that, that I've, I, I'm uncomfortable by this, this, mm-hmm. this philosophy, but the explanation we're getting here is explanations that I felt in my own church growing up. You know, uh, I, I grew up in a, in a, in a Calvinist church, mm-hmm. and... I remember struggling with that issue of yeah. everything is preordained. Yeah. Everything is preordained. You know, it, it, uh, I, I, I get it. Yeah. I do. Now, I, I will say that it seems, and, you know, I actually don't know whether to include this in his philosophy or just include this as personal choice, but it seems that the purpose uh, he decided was best for him and was a good purpose for most people. He actually kind of, you know, uh, preached it i'll say um <laughs> is more or less hedonism i, I was thinking yeah. the same thing he's yeah. almost a hedonist oh yeah yeah well and i, he, I see I, I think he gets to he gets to a hedonist place but he gets to it through a different yes route. yeah yes yeah. yeah because the hedonist i think would say pleasure for pleasure's sake our purpose right. is hedonism yeah and he says well there there is no purpose but if you enjoy it and you don't have a purpose, why not make that your purpose? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, and maybe that is like he was a playboy and, and, and partying and sex, but maybe to you it's gardening. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. hey, Everybody why has not? has their own thing. Yeah. You know, um, so so I, I don't necessarily, when I look at him, say that he would say you need to party and and, and, and be be as, as frivolous as I was. No, he's, he'd say that you need to do whatever fulfills you. Yeah. Yes, be as frivolous as you want to be is, yeah. is, I think, what he would say. Or as purposeful as you want to be. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and not to say that I think that he was doing these things 
um, for the purpose of spreading his philosophy. Um, but I think living life in such a way antithetical to um, what was being taught around him, I think served the idea that he was living out the philosophy that he was preaching. Um, and I think if he had come to this philosophy and decided that the most pleasure filled thing for him to do was to garden, um, I suspect we probably would not have known so much about him. I think angst drives philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're, you know, if you're satisfied, you're not writing a philosophy book. Yeah. Yeah. And necessity is the mother of invention and mental uh, necessity is the mother of philosophy, you know. Insert cliche here. Yeah. Exactly. Can't do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll put on a bumper sticker. How's that? Sounds good to me. So before we go making bumper stickers, do we want to uh, rate a beer? Mm-hmm. I think we do. I All right. We do. Well, we are drinking Mr. Wiggles Double Dank IPA by Raw and Sons out of Fort Worth, Texas. It's a 9.2%. Part of the Den of Sin, Den of Sin series. Oh, I didn't realize that, but that's perfect. That's a, it is a great one. I love yeah. this can. This can is cool. It, it is. is. I, I do want to know the backstory behind the dog and how he ended up here. I don't His care. name is Mr. Wiggles. Is it the owner's dog? Probably. Is it the dog that hung around the brewery, or did they make him up? I like the explanation that our uh, um, what, what marketing director marketing director gave, gave that, that that Mr. Wiggles was her ex boyfriend's nickname. Oh yeah, that was great. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So, oh, Lord. who wants to start? I'll start. All yes. Right. All right. So, um, guys, you can imagine... Mike likes another IPA. You can imagine how happy I was whenever you told me that we were getting a, a, a double IPA here. Um, oh, man. It doesn't taste like a double IPA to me. It's, uh, it's good. There's a hoppiness to it, uh, but it's not... Again, it's not that overbearing hoppiness, and uh, I, I, I think that, that I have to stop saying that I don't like IPAs. Because, I think you do. Because this is a good one. I'm, I've enjoyed it. It's, uh, it's thin, but you would expect that from this. Uh, there's a little bit of a fruity overtone in there. I like that. Um, the bell curve is there. I, you know, it, it, When you drink it, 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 it kind of shocks you, and it rises up, and then it, it, it leaves you. Um, I think this is an IPA done, done pretty well. Uh, is this going to be the beer that I go buy every day? No, it's not going to be that because, it's again, it's still a little more hops than I want to have. But I've enjoyed it. I would, uh, I would, I, I would definitely like this beer if I was uh, if I was fishing. I think this would be a good beer to take fishing with yeah, me. I, I think it, I think it works well. I'm going to give it a pretty high rating. I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go three two. Okay. Well, with that said, I, I guess I'll go next. Now he's going to torpedo it. Uh, I think that this is oh, so. We, we talked. We've talked many times about how you know the cliche of 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 the the thing for a while. They would just shove as much hops as you yeah, can, yeah. and 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 that's your marketing strategy. And and I think we're we're coming out of that phase with Thank IPAs. God. Uh, and I think this is a, a, a double IPA done right. It's definitely got the amount of hops required for a double IPA, but instead of grabbing whatever you can and shoving it in a vat they balanced it if i feel like that's they a good way to put it they Very tried well. some things and found out what works well together and have made something that that has a synergy about it instead of something that's fighting itself um i think you're right i think it does have a bell <laughs> curve i can taste different hops in here but they're all working together in harmony yeah, yeah. Uh, it does have fruity overtones. It also has a very green flavor in there somewhere. That's a, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and, and and you can really tell that that it is hop driven and not sugar or malt driven. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hop forward. I think this is a double IPA done right. Uh, I like it. Uh, I'm starting to to get my faith in IPAs restored again. Right. And I'm giving it a three five. Okay. Holy balls, you guys. And now uh, you're going to butcher it. She's gonna go. It's shit. It's a it's a point nine. This, I, this I, is I, what I, I'm not looking. I'm gonna guess right now that she says a two point three. Four point two. Really? Yes. Nice. Oh lord. I love this beer. Really? Yes. <laughs> this was all. I thought I was gonna be the high rank on this one. I love this. It's a good um, beer. I don't know that I can add anything to what you guys have had to say about Except it. Except a lot of points. Except an entire point <laughs> on your rating. 
Um, but no. But I think that's fair whenever I'm, again, it's. Right. You know, <laughs> um, I would expect an IPA fan to be a, to, to rate, rate this higher. Right. Um, plenty of hops. Uh, I like the, the fruity compliment to it. Not a lot of grain profile, but that's what you expect in an IPA. Um, it's medium to full bodied, which I'm really liking as a wintery type beer. Um, it is a 9.2, but that alcohol isn't overwhelming. That is a good point. Um, it'd be easy to drink. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and that's the thing I've only gotten through half of my beer, but it's because I've been deliberately pacing myself because it's very good. It is very, very good. <laughs> um, uh, from the first sip. And that's that's one of the things I remember about the old school IPAs was like that first sip was smack you in the face, yeah. like a painful amount of of hops where it was like they didn't take into consideration the way that the flavor of one hop was going to balance with the smell of the other. And and it was it, it was a fucking war zone going into your mouth. And it was terrible. Um Especially that first sip. Maybe you got used to it after a few because, you know, your taste buds kind of acclimate. Yeah, I didn't. But this one is good from the first sip. It stays good. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's going to dull a little bit. Uh, it tastes, after a few sips, it tastes a little less sweet. Um, the hop profile kind of mellows out a little bit. But it's still very, very good. So it gets a 4.2 from me. Okay. Excellent beer. Okay. Awesome. I would totally buy this again. You know, here's my problem is, is I, I agree with everything everybody said, and I don't have a problem with anybody's ranking, and yet we're a full point apart. Yes. You know, it, How would you improve it? Well, uh, the reason I went 3.2 is because I, it's, just, it's hard for an I, IPA to get, to get much higher than that Fine. for me. If you're not a, to me, I'm the voice of the non-IPA people, mm -hmm. and this is what they're... Balancing know. out the ratings. Yeah. 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 It, it, you know, I, I don't want the non-IPA person to hear me say a four and go, oh, this is what I'm going to like. Right. If, you, if your tastes are like me, this is probably not going to be what you're going to want to drink mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. So, you know, kind of trying to be fair with it. Fair enough. Fair uh, enough. Okay. Um, but that was that was it was that was really good. So it doesn't get a five for me. So it's got to have some room for improvement. Um, honestly, it would probably be. I really like a grain profile in my beers, which is part of why IPAs aren't my go-to. Um, and so, I guess I would like to see more grain profile in it. But then that's not going to make it as good of an IPA. Yeah, that, that, that's my problem is I'd like a little heavier, thicker beer, but that's not an IPA. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, I, I guess I'm going to flat out say uh, what everybody else has been beating around the bush on. Uh, if you want to get a higher rating, don't be an IPA. But I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't see a way that, that this can improve yeah. as an yeah. IPA. No. It, it yeah. really is. No. It, it's, it's a very great good. IPA. Very, very good. And, you know, there's also something I found is when you say a beer can't improve on itself, um, you can go down avenues in mm -hmm. your decisions of making a beer and then hit the maximum of that avenue. Mm -hmm. But if way back here you'd have gone a whole different direction, you could have gone, let's say, a lot further, yeah. but you've just maximized yeah. kind of your direction. So I can't think of a flavor to add to this, but I can't think of better IPAs, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I guess, especially for any newer listeners that we have... Um, we are not ranking these as beer judges rank them. Yeah. We are ranking them on enjoyability, drinkability. Yeah, yeah. Um, would we want to buy it again? Is this Joe a Six pleasant Pack. experience? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It is a, it is very much a, um, layman's interpretation of the beer. We are not judging the quality by which the beer is made. It's um, standard and all yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, we're not going to be giving the same ratings that somebody um, judging this in a beer competition is going to be giving. Nor are um, we doing beer advocate. Nor are we doing the no. way best <laughs> beer advocate. Um, but uh, so all of that to say, take our own ratings with a, a grain of salt and recognize that um, a lot of what we're measuring here is Personal. how we're enjoying yeah. it. Um, if you find that your tastes are very similar to one of ours, um, then, you know, you might look at our ratings on our website to see if, if you think you would enjoy a certain beer or not. Yeah. Find, uh, find whoever you agree with most and go with their rating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which should be me. Yeah. 
Yeah, Always. go find go find mine and <laughs> on all of our uh, actually on all of our beer posts for anybody who hasn't been to our website at the bottom we do list like um, each of our individual ratings in a star rating format um, so you can see like who torpedoed the beer yeah and yeah. who inflated its rating ridiculously <laughs> well so if if we're all going out and, and giving pleas for why they should uh, uh, go with our rating I, I guess I will take mine and uh, uh, concede the point that you should not go with my rating all I ask is that you get out there try new beers and oh try yeah new. definitely no go with mine all right uh, anyway so you ready to play our game will yeah. it get you laid um I think it will with anybody in the uh, craft beer community. Yeah, if, if you're, you bring if, this to somebody who already... If you're a beery. Yeah. If you bring this to somebody who already enjoys craft beers, I think there is a lot to appreciate here. It is a 9.2, so it's pushing up on the Cosby level, so be careful with it. I, I think it'll It comes in a four-pack, la- though. So. I think it'll get you laid with anybody. So here's the deal. I love that you said that, because I had already chosen my category before you said that, but it plays so well. I'm actually bringing out a category I haven't touched in a long time. This is a weed-out beer. Grab this on the first yeah. date. If she doesn't yeah. like yeah. it, ditch her. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and as far as the lawnmower beer goes, hell yeah, I drink this while mowing the lawn. I think it, yeah. I think it works well. I think it's, it's refreshing. Uh, it's a little heavy, so you're not going to want to have six of them, but they only come in four packs, so you, you'll be okay. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's, that, that was a good beer. It was a real good beer. I enjoyed that. Absolutely. Well, time to get back to absurdism. So I, I, I kind of want to ask, um, you know, you, you, I'll start with you, Mike. You, you've kind of given uh, conflicting answers, I'll say, on, on where you, you fall on this. Uh, do you think this is a philosophy you could apply to your personal life? Do you think this is something you could be happy with? Or I'm is a, it as absurd as it purports to be? I'm in a real strange place because I came into this after the the, the minor bit of research I did. I, I, I kind of watched a couple of YouTube videos and read the wiki is what I did. Uh, and I came into this very much feeling uh, that this was not my philosophy, that it was a, it was a hopeless philosophy. But through the discussion... Here I have seen that there's there's something here for me. There's something here that I could I could put in my toolbox. Mm-hmm. It's not my philosophy that I could run my life by. Right. But it's a it's something that I could slide in the toolbox and and consider. So I think there's a value to it. Um, kind of a weird place for me. I really wasn't expecting to be there. Yeah, Anna. I am glad that you're not finding this as. Uh Doomsdayish, as you have found nihilism and existentialism in the yeah, past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think y'all are getting better at selling it to me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I did not change anything that I said <laughs> from but, existentialism and nihilism. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I want to throw something else out here on this beer while yes. I'm thinking about it that I didn't mention earlier. It pairs well with coffee, in case anybody's at all oh, curious. Oh, yeah, that's it. good it, to it know. Does. It is better. Oh. So. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, and to me, that's that, that's a value to it, too. Yes. Yeah. Because I'm always drinking coffee. Me too. Yeah. yeah. So for me, this was very interesting. Uh, when I when I first came into it, I've, I've kind of alluded to this earlier, but uh, I viewed it as something competing with nihilism. And I actually uh, probably came into this... A, a little bit with a little bit of a cold shoulder t- toward it. Well, you're kind of a you've always kind of been a supporter of nihilism. Yeah, I, I identify as a nihilist, and and so I came into Still? this. Well, so uh, yeah, I'll get there. I'll get there. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of came into this thinking, well, now they're going to try and knock me off nihilism. I'll show them, and but I, I, I try to knowing my own biases, kind of read it with an open mind, and. So I, the thing that changed for me is, is as I said earlier, I no longer view this as competing with nihilism, but building on it. And so after looking at it, I do um, identify as an absurdist, but I still identify as a nihilist. I, I, I don't see those as contradictory anymore. Um, so, so with that, I, I, I think I found something interesting. Um, now I don't know that, that this has changed my view at all in the way I live, but just kind of given me a new, uh, kind of tag to put on my existing beliefs, if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, so you're an absurd nihilist. I was always absurd. I know, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the, the next question I want to go into is I think there are I many out there. Answer. Huh? I didn't get to answer. You were second. It was him. It no, was... I, I no, commented to Mike about how I was glad that he wasn't depressed about this. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. please go ahead. We don't really care about your opinion. I don't give a shit. I'm going to push it anyway. You have boobs. That is true. <laughs> um, but no, I, 
I actually don't know that I believe that um, this is clearly not a philosophy all on its own. Um, I think what Camus has managed to do, right or wrong, um, is something that you saw more um, in ancient Greece. Um, a lot of the philosophies that they were developing were trying to determine what the best way was to live your life. Um, we got away from that in more modern philosophy and just kind of stuck with asking questions without a goal of actually finding answers, uh, finding answers that we could apply as solutions to how to live our lives. Um, I think Camus has hearkened back to that, to that ancient Greek style of philosophy and provided answers. And frankly, I like them. Um, and I, what I found here was that I think I've been an absurdist all along. Mm -hmm. I always thought you were absurd. I am. I have been, always. It had um, very little to do with philosophy. I just always thought you were an absurd character. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, anytime. Um, but what I found was that I've always been an absurdist. I just didn't know what to call it. Yeah. So my next question um, if you read The Stranger, uh, the guy does some rather fucked up shit throughout the book, uh, including helping a guy beat his ex-girlfriend, um, killing a man, uh, uh, a lack of, of remorse for his mother. Uh, and I think many people would look at that and, and see it as, as rather immoral. He also does some moral things. Um, I think there are others who, who would look at, at the philosophy as a whole and see it as a rather moral one, not being bound to, to work for someone else, kind of doing your own thing and, and, and you know, uh, uh, living your life to your fullest potential. And I think there are others who might even go so far as to say you could be an immoral or, or moral absurdist. So I guess what I want to ask now is, is absurdism a moral philosophy an immoral philosophy or an amoral philosophy? Amoral, 100%. Moral, immoral, or amoral. Yeah. But I think that it is amoral um, for the reasons that Mike cited as putting this as an element in his toolbox. Um, I, I have stood for a long time on the belief that no single moral philosophy can apply to everything. Um, and so I don't think that absurdism has anything to do with moral behavior, actually. Um, I think it has more to do with how it is that you direct your life. Um, and then the choices that you make after accepting the absurdity of the universe and a life without purpose um, can be moral or immoral but are not necessarily by which route you choose there, absurd or not absurd. Um, I think at that point you're going to be applying a moral philosophy, which maybe you're applying utilitarianism, uh, maybe you're applying the non-aggression principle, something like that. Um, but it is amoral. It has nothing to do with uh, amoral. Amoral. amoral, yes. Okay. I'm going to say immoral. <gasps> okay. I'm going to say immoral, uh, and I'm going to go back to the the, the, the fact that, that that morality is defined. And I, I just pulled it up because I was curious about this. Concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior, if morality means that there, there's a distinction between right and wrong and good and bad, I think by definition this one is immoral. It is the opposite of that. There Why? is no right and wrong. There is no good and bad. It's just whatever. Which is the opposite amorality no it was the opposite of the definition of morality which is immorality amorality, amorality. would be that it doesn't affect that, that, that it has no bearing on morality i think it does have a bearing i think it's the opposite of it something that is moral by when you're talking about morality something that is moral is good and something that is immoral is bad no no morality is that that there is good and bad this is saying that there is not. It is immoral. Yeah. So I'm actually going to, to say that it's it's an incomplete moral philosophy. Uh, and my reasoning there is that I th uh, morality um, uh, and ethics, which is 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 a 
Oh wait, now now we're having a competition <laughs> of definitions. I gotta, uh-huh. yeah, I gotta. Yeah. Okay, so morality uh, deals with how one should live their life. Uh, it goes back to ethics, ethos, yeah, yeah. and all that. And I think this does uh, definitively answer, whether it's a, a right or wrong answer, but does definitively answer one element in how one should live their life. It actually presents three scenarios when you face the, the question of, of nihilism in which you can choose to respond and de- definitively tells you this is the right one to respond with. However, I think... We can look at some of the actions that can come from this, particularly in the stranger, and say this could be very good in certain situations and very bad in others. And I don't believe it gives a complete moral foundation for one to live one's entire life, okay. but only answers a very small brick on that foundation. Okay. I, I think we're having a grammatical argument here. Okay. okay. Shocker. Because I think that, that if you define moral as good and immoral as bad, then it is amoral. Okay. But... The definition of moral is not that. The definition of moral is concerning good and bad, and I think this doesn't concern either one. That is a way in which you can speak about it, and I think it depends on the connotation. But another definition for it is holding or manifesting high principles for proper conduct, indicating that okay. moral is relating to the good. And I think you so can see that. you're using a different definition of moral than I'm using. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. And I think you can see that illustrated when you define immoral in that it on, it relates to improper acts conduct. that are improper. See, but uh, I, 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 and I can understand that if that's the definition you're using. I'm using the definition of morality as dealing with good or bad. I think this is neither. So... In I summation, agree with that. <laughs> in summation, syntax So we're the aside, same thing, but we're different gra- grammars. Fuck you, Mike. That's my, <laughs> that's my grammar Nazi. You two believe that it doesn't deal with good or bad. No, I don't think Correct. it does. Correct. And I believe it does, but it's not a complete... Uh, uh, it's not a complete answer to yes, everything. But, okay. but two to one, you're wrong. And I'm going to prove it. <laughs> you two are agreeing. You must be wrong. <laughs> so... That's a good point. What you say is that um, Camus assigns of the three solutions that can or the three paths that you can take once you recognize the absurdity of life so first of all um there is the situation where one does not recognize absurdity does not recognize the meaninglessness of the universe um i don't know how you would categorize that there um but he does whenever he's talking about uh committing suicide like physical suicide. He does not, according to what I found, um, actually categorize that as an immoral act, um, but recognizes that there are some people who do not have the cognitive ability, uh, do not have the strength of will to live in a world where, um, where, they have no purpose and they determine that life is not worth living and therefore die. I agree with or you. Or kill themselves. I agree with you uh, and, and that in, in where I was looking, he did not use the word morality as well. I will agree with that statement. However, I don't even think he characterized it as immoral. However, my beer is he, broken. He went through and listed three ways you can live and rank them with one being better than the other. He did come through and say there is a good way to live, there is a, a, a less good way to live, and this is the way you should live. That is ethics. That is morality. I think that he argued that were you to continue living, this is the way that you should do it. Yes, I, I agree. He said that. And that is that is the, the, the fundamental definition of ethos. Mm. Ethos, not morality. But morality is 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 a discussion within. You're, well, you're ethics. right. You're right. Yeah. It's a it's a narrower version of, of ethics. You're right. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 ethics dealing with right and wrong. You are yeah. correct. Yeah. 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 Um, I really think that we're all we're all very very close, and we're coming down to different. Fair know, enough. It's like we're all looking at the same piece of art from a different angle. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's looking at me. No, he's looking at me. My angle is the correct one. Uh, because it agrees with Anna. Yeah, exactly. Never yeah, mind. John, you win. <laughs> hey, no. <laughs> one time. I want to be right one time. All right. Is there I'm anything right to tell you? I left y'all some beer, but yeah. y'all seem, seem like you're still drinking. Y'all are slowed down a little on me. Yeah, I know. 
yeah, just thank you. This was a lot more fun than I than I thought it was going to I'm be. I'm glad. Isn't that terrible to say? No, it's fantastic. I was uh, I was not excited about this one. I know you weren't. But uh, I, I I y'all are fucking me all up. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> Is there anything else we need to add to this before we sign out? That's going to be the new subtitle of our of, of our what season four we're starting. We're starting season God. five. Five. We're starting season. Wait a five. minute. Yeah, you're this, right. This is season four right yeah. now. Oh, so balls. season five is going to be subtitled "Fucking Mike's World Up." Is it really? Yeah. It is. We've been at it a long time. Really? We're concluding our fourth year and starting our fifth. Doesn't feel wow. like it. Wow. Okay. The More than ten percent of your oh, life is. has been spent on this podcast. Well, not yours, not Mike. My life. <laughs> not yours. <laughs> Talk about us. <laughs> uh, Whoa. You'll need another two seasons to catch I need, up. I, I need, I need another more. two beers to cope with that. Um, I love ooh. you too. Okay, that is strong. Oh, that beer is strong. Um, but no, I don't think there's really? anything. Well, when you chug it like I just did, yes. That's the problem. Well, that's the it's problem. Not a chugging not a chugging beer. It is not a chugging beer. Um, but no, I think that's everything that we have on Absurd. Um, so anyway. Sometimes she slides into French. <laughs> is that what that was? Yes, Shh. she's been reading Camus. Our listeners don't know French. It's okay. We'll just nice. tell them. Um, but anyway, it's primitive Gaelic hit up our website. Uh, like I was saying earlier, we got some cool shit on there. We um, did. join our newsletter every week. Actually, it's been every week here lately. Cause yeah, I have yeah, not yeah. now you have been rocking it. A lot of times what that means is that at 11 AM on Friday, I go, fuck it's Friday. And I haven't sent out the newsletter yet. <laughs> That's how everything else around here goes. <laughs> that, is, that is actually true. Um, That's how we pick our topic some weeks. Yes. Sometimes. Um, but anyway, and so every week lately, our newsletter has been going out <laughs> after I skipped for like two months. I think I'm the sorry. only thing that we can guarantee is done on time is these episodes go out when they're supposed to. The audio. Most the, the audio. Time. <laughs> yeah. Um, Video is almost always out. I gotta say, in four years, we have not missed a single episode. On the podcast. Yeah, on the, on the podcast. Yeah. The we audio, have been yeah. late on a We've been couple. late a couple of times. On you, YouTube. We, and, oh, no, and, on the on the podcast feeds as well. Yeah. Oh. But it's, like it's never been you, like... You come in and you're like, our new show's not up. What are you doing? Yeah, I'm it, like, oh, fuck. I just always assume it's Stitcher. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it is most of the time. It is um, Stitcher. But it, and it's never been like we didn't have everything ready. It's like we forgot to click a button yeah. that was like save at I the very I didn't categorize end. it, and then yeah. so it just went into some random black hole on our website <laughs> yeah and so we got to go through and click the button but yeah it's never been like we didn't have it already yeah, yeah we've never missed an episode entirely which is super fucking cool um but, but we're gonna most reliable harder. podcasting we're gonna your feed i to, promise you that i i i'm gonna try much much harder to miss miss some episodes next session i'm gonna push you out of your chair <laughs> but anyway um hit up our website join our newsletter because we actually send it out now buy shirts um yeah uh Get swag on teespring.com slash stores slash six pack philosophy. If you have a recommendation for a better source for us to put our shirts on, let me know because I kind of don't like Teespring. Or that a would recommendation be at, for a show. That would all be at contact us at six pack philosophy.com. Good idea. Um, other than that, if you want to find us on social media, just search six pack philosophy. And if we're there, you'll find us that way. Instagram, Instagram, and Twitter. Instagram and Facebook mostly, and a little bit of Twitter too. Um, other than that, smoke signals. Mike reads smoke signals. I read semaphore. <laughs> um, so I don't read much. Palm reading. Mike reads. John reads palms. Yeah. <laughs> Look, cause I write my notes there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, this is done. Is it done? Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun, and we hope you have too. Cheers. Cheers. One hour show and a one hour outro. <laughs> Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 